Over the past few months, I have really gained a deeper appreciation for Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. I enjoyed the season when it first came out, but it stayed on my mind for a long time afterwards, which eventually led to me exploring my thoughts on the season a lot more in depth. And after doing that, I gotta say that I genuinely think this is possibly the best anime adaptation I have ever seen. So I figured I'd share my findings in this ridiculously long video as to why that is, including some stuff I haven't had the chance to talk about yet starting at the very beginning the hidden inventory arc this arc truly impressed me not just because i thought it was really good but also because of how much better i thought it was than the first season the story worked so much better the animation and art significantly stepped up and the music was used in a really good way that really amplified the story but there was one thing that made all of these elements work together as well as they did and that was the directing or should i say the director shota gosho Shozono. Shota Goshozono won the best director at the anime awards this year and he absolutely deserved it as what he did on Jujutsu Kaisen season 2 absolutely blew me away. To explain easily really quickly, the director is the person who is in charge of the whole product. He's responsible for the creative decisions and instructs all the workers of what to do. Now I'm not the most knowledgeable when it comes to directing and the makings of anime so when I reference directing in this video a lot of it is just gonna be me being like yo look at this this is so cool. Already in the first episode, I was extremely impressed. It starts off with a pretty short sequence where everything is completely gray and desaturated as Ghetto moves through the streets just to illuminate everything in blue. Like look at the difference the blue light makes here, making what was before a completely gray and lifeless scene into one with really vibrant colors. We then get to the part where Utahime and Meimei go to this house to exercise the curse and the camera work here is just A1. There are so many creative places they put the camera there's this one shot where the camera moves through the wall and you actually see the insides of it, like all the wires and technology. The two of them quickly get stuck in an infinite loop, where no matter how much they walk, they'll just end up in the same space. And they show us this by, well showing us. The camera is completely static and the two characters walk past it time and time and again. It conveys the loop perfectly. Or this shot here where the camera keeps moving down the hall but just keeps ending up in the same place. This whole sequence is just so fun to watch and super impressive. I didn't even talk about the quick scene before this which showed the family of the people who used to live in this house, making it look like it was recorded on an old handheld camera, even making the art style look like it could have been made in the 90s, further communicating that this happened long ago. All of the parts I've talked about so far takes place in the first 10 minutes of the episode. The first half of the episode contains three different sections which all have a completely different visual style. Isn't that fucking crazy? I could literally pick an episode at random and just praise the visuals endlessly. And changing the art style is something that happens like very frequently. Whether it be the neon cyberpunk style in the Yuji vs Choso fight, the Mechamaru Gurren Lagan reference, the way Nanami was drawn in this episode, the way they draw Fushiguro in episode 41 and how the first half of the episode has the black bars. There's also so many drawings that capture the manga art style spot on. It shows that these people know what they're doing and that they know the source material very well. And all of this just makes it more engaging to watch. It adds variety and also can just help show what type of scene it is we're looking at. Again, I'm not the best at explaining this stuff, but look at the style of these shots of Yuji. They somehow make me understand even better what emotions Yuji is feeling here. I also love how many shots look like they've been done in 3D because they're so well animated. This is so hard to pull off in 2D without it looking like this. What the hell? Oh my god, no way. But it makes it so much more engaging to watch because you're not used to it happening in anime due to how hard and time consuming it is to do. Normally the camera is more static and things will come into frame on their own. All the shots just become more memorable due to how they're done. Like everyone remembers the shot of Gojo and Ghetto just walking. It's just so full of life and passion even in a simple scene like this. Off the top of your head, can you remember any shot from a different show or movie of someone walking normally? Name 10 books. Probably not because that's not moments people normally put too much effort into making look good or creative. I'm sure you all remember this transition right here or this shot of Ghetto in the shower or this transition. All of this comes together to just really make a good adaptation. I'm definitely not done talking about the directing and visuals because the season 
season still has a lot more to show off, but let's talk about the actual story of this arc. I think what this arc does best is Gojo himself. Giving him more screen time and making us more attached to him is a great way to make us care more when he gets sealed in the Shibuya arc. And he is just a really fun character to follow. Something as simple as his smile is incredibly infectious and just makes it fun and engaging to watch. And every shot of him always looks really good, but it's like they spent twice as much time drawing him compared to everyone else. I don't know what it is, they literally just slapped some sunglasses on him and he looks like 10 times better. I liked Gojo as a character a lot already, but this part made me care for him so much more. He's no longer just the overpowered go lucky character. In fact, I really like how they made him being overpowered an integral part of his character arc. He does become the strongest, he is able to win in every situation but it comes with a cost. The stronger Gojo gets, the more he distances himself with the people around him and is so strong that he can no longer relate to them. But what Gojo really needed was not strength but rather understanding. Understanding of the people around him, and more specifically Ghetto. Instead of being a god, he needed to be human. He's strong enough to do whatever he wants, but not to communicate with the person he wants to the most. Gojo wants Ghetto on his side, he wants his companionship, as he views him as an equal. And Ghetto wants Gojo's strength to fulfill his plan but neither of them can get what they want. I think what Gojo goes through here in this arc is some incredible stuff, and again, really makes me care about him and the few times he appears in the Shibuya arc. That being said, there were some things I didn't think worked as well as they could have, those being Riko and Ghetto. I really like the idea of Ghetto turning evil, and like I said, I really like how that worked in regards to Gojo's character. I like that he gives a really good insight into the harsh reality of a Jujutsu sorcerer, which helps expand the world of Jujutsu. To Kaisa. This helps make somewhat sense of why Ghetto turn evil, but only somewhat. I mean, I think it makes sense on paper why he turns evil, but the execution of it is way too rushed for me. I think it would have been a good idea to actually show Ghetto's internal struggle a bit earlier in the arc, because to me, his turn came a bit out of nowhere. There is the scene I mentioned before, but that obviously doesn't count, as that is something that happens after the whole Rico incident and was more of a teaser of what's to come that is exclusive to the anime, kind of like a trailer. Although I will say that it helps fix this issue somewhat in the anime, as again, it feels less random, so huge props to the anime for doing what it could in that regard. Still though, I don't think it was foreshadowed well enough, or at all, and that kind of made that part not as enjoyable to me. Now, a way this could have been fixed would have been via Rico. Rico Amanai is a character that when first introduced, I thought was very fun. She had a great personality and I was ready to see what would happen with her, but nothing really does. I think she works well to showcase some of the things I mentioned before, like the corruption of the Jujutsu society, but as a character, there is never any attempt to make the audience care about her on a deeper level. Her death affects Ghetto the most, even though she was a lot closer to Gojo and barely even spoke to Ghetto the entire arc. Which to be clear, I do like that it doesn't affect Gojo because it shows the way he transcended. But in regards to Ghetto, I don't think it really makes sense. Had they actually formed some sort of connection, I think not only her death would have been more impactful, but Ghetto's turn would have also been more impactful. Another character that furthers the progress of Ghetto's turn to evil is Haibara. He's basically the one that pushes Ghetto over the edge, and yet we basically didn't know Haibara at all. So again, while I understand Ghetto's motivation on paper, as it's very nicely explained during this scene with Yuki, which is a great scene that works well for both characters, I found it to be a bit unbelievable and a bit too sudden. This really isn't a huge issue though, as I still thoroughly enjoyed the arc. At this point, I was very surprised by just how much better it was than season 1. And what comes directly after it is one of the best parts of the entire story to me, which is Mechamaru's episode. Which is crazy! because it's Mechamaru. It's kind of incredible how they managed to make one of the best parts of the entire story so far about Mechamaru. Who? This was a character that I didn't have any particular strong emotions towards beforehand, but it's now one of my favorite characters in Jujutsu Kaisen. When we first got introduced to him, I did sympathize with him and his backstory. He was born differently to everybody else and all he wanted to be was 
normal. And he would even go to the lengths of betraying the people he cares about to achieve this. I like how even though he's the traitor, he still is not on the side of the bad guys. He's risking everything to get what he wants. And after he does, the first thing he thinks about is getting back to Jujutsu High, telling them all he knows about Mahito and Geto and meeting Miwa, the one person he's formed the bond with, who also has like 5 minutes of screen time. When asked why Mekamaru is the prime suspect for being the traitor, the reason isn't because he accidentally gave away a hint or anything like that. In fact, he wasn't even suspicious. The reason is simply that everybody else wasn't suspicious. And I think that line alone speaks volumes about his character. He didn't interact with the other classmates in a friendly way because he didn't want to, rather because he felt he wasn't good enough to do so with the way he was, which is why he urgently felt like he needed to fix his body. It makes me remember the fight he had with Panda in the first season, where Panda tells him that he hasn't had a single thing in common with humans since he was born, but he doesn't care. If anything, he's even less normal than Mekamaru is. But Mekamaru just can't accept this, and so he still tries to get his body back and has to pay the consequences. Mekamaru's story ends in tragedy, but it's not over yet as he gets to talk to Miwa one last time. And it's clear that Miwa likes Mekamaru. Even before this, it was clear that she liked him, even though he was a robot. She tells him that she wants to see him one day, despite what he might actually look like. Meaning Mekamaru didn't need his body back in the first place, because what he wanted more than anything else was to be with Miwa. And if he wanted to, he could have been with her, because she also wanted to be with him. But Mekamaru didn't realize this. To me, Mekamaru is the type of person that says, once I get rich, then I'll be happy. Or once I move out, then I'll be happy. But if they really sat down and thought, do I need these things? They would come to the conclusion that they don't. And this is what I think the message we can take from Mekamaru's character is, that we don't need anything to be happy. We can choose to be happy right now. Do not spend your whole life chasing something that is right in front of you. And now it's time to talk about the fight, which is one of the best looking fights in Jujutsu Kaisen, if not the best. Which perfectly highlights why this art style was the way to go. I mean look at this bro, this Isn't shit buzzing. Awesome. There's been a decent amount of people upset about the art style change, who don't like the simplistic art style and prefer the season 1 art style, which is fine. People don't like change and that's not gonna change. But I think it's pretty undeniable how much better these types of more simplistic art styles are for the animation itself. The animators don't have to draw like a million little details on every single frame and can instead just focus on actual animation. Of course, this doesn't mean that I prefer the show to just be like stick men, but take a look at these two clips as an example. Maybe you preferred the first one, and again, that's okay, but it's just so janky compared to the second one. This is why all your favorite fights from Naruto all have an art style similar to this. And I think this fight also greatly benefits from it. Although I do have to question what Mekamaru's plan was, because at first, it looks like he escapes, and I'm like, okay, that's fair, makes sense. But then he has the audacity to say, Oh shit! He had successfully escaped, but decided to go back for the kill. I think I was just so surprised to see a side character like Mekamaru have the balls to go against the two main antagonists. Even they're surprised, like, Is this nigga serious? But a few moments later, he says something weird. So, you know that you can't win, and that you need to get Gojo's help if you want to win. So then, why did you decide to fight them when you were already able to run away just fine? But but okay, maybe he's going to try to escape outside of the veil and contact Gojo this time because after all, according to himself, that's the only way he can win this. But no, he fights them anyway. And after he thinks he's killed Mahito, he says, okay, time to kill Geto now. What? Seriously, this was so strange. I don't know why he contradicted himself so much, but anyway. Aside from that little detail, this fight is absolutely bonkers. Mechs are not really my cup of tea, but I thoroughly enjoy this. The voice actor did give me some PTSD, but I tried to ignore that. There's so many twists and turns. One moment you think Mahito has the upper hand, then all of a sudden Mekamaru pulls out a crazy trick out of his sleeve and completely flips it. This is something Bleach does in like literally every fight in the entire show. It works because you actually don't know who is gonna win, which again, I just have to stress enough is an incredible feat because we're talking about the two main antagonists 
versus this guy. What is that? What is that? I think it's so weird how this whole part feels so isolated to the rest of the story. We see Itadori and the others try to find him at the start, but after that, they never speak of it again. We never see anybody's reaction to Mekamaru's death or their reaction to him being the traitor. I guess that's just another way to show how isolated he really was to everyone. Well, that's enough sadness for now, because we need to get started with Jujutsu Kaisen's best arc, which of course is the Shibuya arc. The animation in this arc somehow got even better, like way better. The characters all got way more shine and development. Everything that I liked about season one was just like amplified in this arc. And I think one of the key elements that made this arc click were the villains. Now we all know the antagonists of Jujutsu Kaisen, just the biggest pieces of shits you've ever seen in your entire life. Like I want to punch every single one of those guys in the face, man. And what I like is how competent they are. Typically in stories, the bad guys are stronger than the good guys and have a clear advantage over them but this time it's a bit more complex than that this time the bad guys are all for the most part stronger than the good guys but the issue is that they're outnumbered obviously gojo is much stronger than all of them so therefore they have to act strategically which they do they succeed with everything that they planned with a lot of sacrifices they formulate a plan to seal gojo and succeed now originally i wasn't a huge fan of how gojo got sealed however i didn't get all the details about the situation right back then which is mainly because well they don't really give any details as to how he got sealed the only thing they say is a minute passed in his mind what does that even mean this could either mean that all the flashbacks that he gets in his head is enough for the minute to pass or because of his sex size it only requires a few seconds now regardless of how interesting those two alternatives might be they never explain which one of them it is. And so because they never actually properly explain what happened, it just kind of seems a bit cheap to me. And so this is another case of it feeling a bit rushed. Now, just for the sake of it, I figured I'd go through the two alternatives that we have. The first one is that he just experienced a bunch of flashbacks, which I'm not really a fan of because this basically implies that Geto knew Gojo would experience all these flashbacks in the span of like a few seconds, which like how would even know that that was gonna happen for a character like gojo to be essentially taken out of the story it has to be done in a way that's really clever if not it feels like they are just taking him out of the story because the story needed it to happen with that being said i think i'm more of a fan of the second option which is gojo's six eyes now i like this more because it actually uses something that was established previously which is gojo's eyes and how they perceive information and obviously kenjaku knows this because he has access to to get those memories that's kind of clever because of gojo's eyes this works specifically on him but wouldn't work on anybody else but i think this alternative also doesn't work that well because of the prison realm itself the prison realm had absolutely been foreshadowed in the story before this no doubt i have no complaints there but i think the issue is that this is the first time we ever see the prison realm be used and because of this it feels like a plot device that specifically exists to seal gojo and nothing else if we had seen it get used on someone else earlier in the story, this would have felt more earned. And also, what was even the point of making Gojo tired? The other curses have to distract him for a bunch of time and I guess make him tired, but why? The only thing that was required was for Gojo to see Geto. What did it matter if he was tired or not? It's so weird because Hanami dies just so that they can distract him. In both of the two alternatives, Gojo just seeing Geto would have been enough. The only reason why I'm kind of harsh on this moment is because this is kind of what the entire premise of the arc is. The whole arc hinges on Gojo being sealed. So for the execution of that to be a bit lackluster is kind of disappointing to me. That being said, I really like the idea of Gojo getting a long flashback of Ghetto when he saw him. This shows us how much Gojo cared about him without explicitly telling us. And I also love the conversation him and Kenjaku have. Ghetto almost taking control back is a good way to show that while he might be evil, he does not have the same goals as Kenjaku. And Gojo's dialogue is great. I just love Gojo's nonchalant attitude and how he's just like, I, right, you guys got this. I believe in y'all. After he gets sealed, our heroes are basically fucked. But we as an audience don't really know this yet because they haven't properly shown us quite how different the power dynamics work here. Plus, they had like all the time in the world to prepare for this, so you'd think that they'd have this in the bag, right? I mean, the arc starts off with Yuji fighting this 
Grasshopper, who I swear is straight out of Hunter x Hunter. I actually love this guy. And while we're exploring Shibuya in the beginning through Yuji and the others, none of the characters seem particularly worried. Yuji has this really playful attitude, kind of similar to Gojo, except Yuji will soon get a wake up call. You are my special. But first, we gotta fight this weird old guy and this creepy old lady. I thought that Yuji and Fushigiro versus the old guy was a pretty fun little fight. It also helps show what different type of abilities exists out there and what's possible to do with curse energy and what's not. The animation is also like incredible. When watching this for the first time, I obviously didn't know how good and how much better the animation was going to get. So when looking back at it now, this might almost seem as not as impressive, but this is still so much better than like all the other animations coming out these days. I think Toji coming back to the story in this way was a great idea because it's the only way I could imagine him coming back by bypassing the rules. It reminds me of Madara bypassing the reanimation in Naruto. He's also a great addition to this arc simply because he's a wild card. You don't know who he's gonna box or how hard he's gonna box them but you know he gonna box. Now remember how I said all the villains are like the biggest assholes you've ever seen in your life? Well shortly after Toji's resurrection we are reintroduced to this absolute piece I love Haruta as a villain so much, and it has a lot to do with the reasons why Mahito works so well. He's just annoying and an asshole and an absolute piece of garbage, but he's my piece of garbage. Aww. In all seriousness though, I don't understand why they killed him off so early. I feel like he hadn't reached his true black air force potential. I just love how before he died, no one was able to get rid of him. Like he kept killing people, kept causing chaos and enjoying himself and no one could truly stop him even though he wasn't even strong. Like this dude is straight up weak as hell and was still pulling off the things he did. The only reason he died was because of his random ass ability that just stopped working. Like we literally got into introduced to his ability as he died. This man went too soon, RIP. I mean, love him or hate him, he gave us one of the most satisfying moments in the series, when Nanami absolutely just curb stomps this man into oblivion. I like Nanami even more than I did before after that. And who's the reason for that? Haruta. Everyone give a big round of applause for Haruta. Now remember how I said I would like to punch every villain in the face? Well, luckily my prayers got answered by the best character in the show. This was satisfying on a whole other level. We then have an episode that is just 20 minutes of straight boxing, bro. Yuji vs Choso wasn't a fight that I was particularly interested in narratively. Like, I don't really care about Choso getting revenge for his brothers or whatever, but I really like the twist that reveals Choso and Yuji being brothers and them teaming up. Like, does Yuji get one new sibling every season? Like, what's going on, bro? But we'll get to that later. First, we have the actual fight. Now, this isn't really the best fight I've ever seen or anything but it definitely is one of the best looking fights if we're just talking about animation and art because holy shit this looks incredible i love the blue and red neon color style they chose and the fact that it's present during the entire fight the subway station they fight in feels so real especially because of like how much of the environment is destroyed during the fight and is used to take cover or to set off the water apparently they used live action footage of a station to create 3d backgrounds which would explain why it looks so realistic. Choso's ability is sick and works so well with the color style. And I love the part where they are in the bathroom just boxing. No tricks or abilities, just hand-to-hand -hand combat for a solid while. And again, the director absolutely cooked. There are so many like first-person shots that look sick. So many different places they've placed the camera like inside of this car, just helping it feel less static and more fun to follow. Again, visually, this fight is a masterpiece and I really love the creativity that went into it. So much so that like I said it doesn't really matter to me that there isn't a deeper reason as to why they're fighting sometimes you just want to see a cool looking fight and this is essentially where Yuji fails he rushed into a fight and lost and shortly after has to face the consequences <laughs> Now, quickly, I do think it's a bit strange that Yuji was sent into Shibuya so early in the first place. Like, this is a pretty dangerous mission, so why isn't, like, all the sorcerers in the world here? We know who our enemies are, but you guys sent in, like, Panda? Like, more than half the people they sent in were students. What was Principal Yaga even doing? They explained that he has to, like, protect some, like, spirit thing or something in case anybody tries to attack it, but nobody ever does try to attack it. Like, what were you doing? They never called for, like, backup or anything? I just thought it was a bit strange how incompetent and honestly stupid the sorcerers ended up looking. Not a single person they sent in 
were as strong as Jogo, who they surely must have known was going to be there. I get that they thought Goja would take care of everything, but he got sealed instantly, and still their tactics remain the same. But anyway, it's time for the next fight, the gang versus this crab guy. I love that this fight starts with the sending guy roasting the fuck out of every person who watches those dog shit 60 fps 4k upscaled anime edits like those shits are so ass. This fight definitely highlights some of the weak sides of Jujutsu Kaisen the first one being how much time it spends explaining and telling us about abilities and how they work and this is most of the time done through a narrator like why couldn't you just show me how the abilities work instead this isn't a book it's an anime. Now, now this kind of reminds me of the Chimera Ant arc from Hunter x Hunter where they also used a narrator a lot. However, in that arc, I actually thought the use of the narrator was just fine. So why do I feel differently when it comes to Jujutsu Kaisen? I'm really not sure. I still had tons of fun watching this fight though as we have so many different characters, abilities, and mechanics at play all at once. Even though we only got to see it for a brief period, the sending guy's ability was dope. Seeing Nanami on screen doing anything is always a treat and Fushigiro saving the others was fire. It was really cool to see because as far as I can remember, this is the first time we've seen a tug of war between domains and we learned that while this tug of war is happening, the domains want hit effect stops working meaning Fushigiro just needs to hold out while they kill this crab dude except he actually has a different plan which is killing himself okay no he actually plans on staying alive this time which I thought was awesome because it shows a little growth for his character but before any of these events can transpire the wild card appears at this point my jaw is just wide open due to the incredible animation I'm seeing and so the crab guy gets taken out and Fushigiro has to fight his dad Toji. This isn't really a fight, more like a guy getting his ass beat. But this definitely contains some of my favorite scenes of the entire show. There's something so ridiculous about Toji throwing whole trucks and smashing up buildings that is somehow awesome and funny at the same time. And Fushigiro's voice actor really sells the fact that he is getting chased by like an absolute monster. Everything about the sequence is just perfect and finally we get the end of Toji's character. While I think this was a bit too quick of a resolution which would have benefited from slower pacing just like the entire show would, I still enjoyed it. And followed by Toji's death we finally get the wake up call that will haunt us for the rest of the series. Sukuna is released and shit goes down. Remember when Goju was trying to save civilians at the start of the arc? Yeah, well, they're all dead now. I don't know why, but it didn't occur to me that Jogo was as strong as he was. I guess because the first time we saw him, he got like absolutely bodied, but like, holy shit, he's so much stronger than like everyone else. It also very unexpectedly made me appreciate and sympathize with his character. You see, I thought the first season established pretty clearly that these guys are bad, they're not sympathetic and must die. But in the second season, this started to change, particularly with the character of Jogo. You see, Jogo was a character that I didn't think much of originally. I mean, look at this guy. It's the dude from Monster Sync. He showed up against Gojo and got folded like an omelet, then just kind of sat back and chilled. I didn't realize you were chill like that. We also didn't really know what his motivation was. Like, okay, curses are evil and stuff, but considering Jogo is as intelligent as he is, there must be a reason he's doing this stuff, but we got nothing. Season 2 started, and for a while, we just saw the regular Jogo. It wasn't until the Sukuna fight that I started to feel kind of bad for him. I felt bad for him because I truly understood understood his motivations. He wanted to be like humans, he wanted to have what they have, a society of curses where they live together. He feels genuine companionship with other curses like Dagon or Hanami, something we haven't seen any other curses do. He feels more like human than curse, which is why he's so different from the other curses. He isn't able to grow as he's too focused on being a human, constantly fighting his own nature. When he acts like a curse, he achieves the most success, like when he takes out the three sorcerers in Shibuya or just randomly burns people and every time he fights his nature he gets burnt and in the end gets consumed by his own flame. His volcano head that I originally thought was funny and goofy is now very symbolic and a great metaphor. I was honestly sad to see him go so early in the story after finally getting attached to him. Like just once I wanted to see him just win or succeed in like a one-on-one -on -one fight instead of getting absolutely demolished by like 
gods. And this part was made extra good by the animation, which at this point I have to say is at its peak. Genuinely, I don't think I've ever seen a season of anime with this level of consistent animation and art quality. We also have Sukuna reinforcing that he is one of the best characters in the show with some really great character moments. My favorite being when he essentially plays red light, green light with Panda and the others. I love Sukuna. He is the first antagonist we meet in the story and he quickly became one of my favorite characters, despite not seeing much of him. Much like other older shonen, he is a demon stuck inside a young boy. Hold on! Except this time, I'm not so sure the boy will befriend or master this demon. I think one of the things that works best with his character is his intelligence. In so many situations, he does things that are so big brain, like absolutely 500 IQ plays. The first instance of this happens in the beginning of the story when he creates a pact with Yuji. Yuji dies because of Sukuna ripping his heart out, giving Yuji two options, die or allow Sukuna to kill more people. Either is a win-win for Sukuna, as he is able to come back via the pact. And this pact allows him to take over Yuji's body at any point he wants, the only condition being that Yuji forgets everything about this pact. I haven't read the manga, but I can guess how this is gonna play out. It's incredible setup and really builds up Sukuna as a solid antagonist. I think the best part of his character and one of the most defining things is that he does not bow down to anyone. He will not accept anyone's help or help anyone else, as he sees that as a weakness. He believes that if you are not strong enough, then you don't deserve to win. And he shows his beliefs numerous times in the series, all in very similar ways. The first one being when he doesn't help Mahito. In fact, he feels insulted that Mahito would even dare touch him. This is such a good moment because it's character defining and tells us exactly what type of person Sukuna is. He's not like Mahito or the other curses, he is his own character. This is why he doesn't help Mahito or Jogo or those random sisters. <laughs> This is why he tells Jogo that he should have burnt everything in his path until he reached Satoru Gojo, the strongest. Anyone trying to do anything else or fight their nature are foolish in Sukuna's eyes. When or if Sukuna dies in the story, I would expect them to have a very different reaction to Mahito's death. Instead of running away like a little bitch, I would think his reaction would be more accepting, fighting to the very end. After all, if he dies, that simply means he wasn't strong enough. But of course, I could be wrong as I've only seen two seasons, so we'll have to wait and see. But the chaos doesn't end here as Sukuna gets another dancing partner to deal with. Now I really like the fight with Gojo, but this one... Not so much. The animation was unbelievably amazing, on par with the Jogo fight, but I just didn't see a need for this narratively. If you remove this fight, it changes nothing in the story. Fushiguro finally summons Maho Ma Ma Fushiguro finally summons Mahoraga, which has been teased since the beginning of the show, but he isn't even conscious to witness it. This fight didn't really have anything to do with him at all, and so we're just really watching action for the sake of it. Maybe if Mahoraga was more more of an interesting character, this could have been fun, but he's just like some random monster who doesn't even speak. You could say that this fight nukes the whole city and Sukuna makes Yuji witness it, but that already happened in the Jogo fight. And I know people are gonna say this is important for the future of the story, but to me, that doesn't really change anything. If it's important to the future of the story, you still have to make me engage while I'm watching it. I would have much preferred it if it was as short as it was in the manga. But again, the animation genuinely is mind-blowing and some of it was even done by the director himself. In fact, Shotago Shosono did a lot of animation this season, which is absolutely insane. He did storyboarding for all of these episodes and also the second ending, and also did key animations for all of these episodes. That's what I'm talking about! This guy is an absolute beast at only 31 years old, even younger than the guy who directed Chainsaw Man, which was only 12 episodes. It showed that Shota actually did some work on himself. He was the director of episode 8, which was the part where we get to see Himeno's apartment, which is absolutely beautiful and also very ambitious in many of its shots. It also contains a decent amount of action scenes at the end that look really good. He also directed one of the best looking episodes of season 1 of Jujutsu Kaisen episode 18. This dude is just insane and 
I really hope he gets to be in charge of season 3 of Jujutsu Kaisen or just gets to be the main director of other shows in general. I also just love the use of colors in this season. That might be one of the visual's strongest aspects. Miwa's train scene looks beautiful, with the background being blue and having a bunch of flying light spheres. There's such a good contrast between bright and dark colors. I love the part where a train drives past and all the colors return to normal until the train is gone again, showing that this is just in her mind, potentially showing that this is how she feels when talking to Mechamaru. The aquarium scene is also pretty similar and really good looking. Generally, blue just looks really good in this season and is a color that's used quite a lot. They also know when to just tone the colors down when they need to, like the Maharaga fight or the scene with Ghetto that I mentioned in the beginning. I love how good sunsets look in this season, especially in the Gojo versus Toji fight, which also contains a pretty sick moment after Gojo hits Ghetto with the hollow purple. The camera pans through a bunch of buildings where the walls all have a hole in them, then panning to Toji's stomach where we see the same hole except it showcases the size of the hole even better by showing how much of Toji's body it takes up, so much that if it had been aimed at the center of his stomach, he would have been split in half. There was no need to show a wide shot of the building as the beam hit as this is way more creative and gives a lot more anticipation. This season looks so good and is directed so well that when you look back at season 1, you realize that it didn't even look that good. The colors are really ugly for the most part, with some exceptions, especially during the exchange event where they just slapped a piss yellow filter on, making every single scene look like this. And just in general, in the rest of the season, the colors are pretty ugly, with a lot of bad lighting and CG effects added in compositing. It makes me appreciate the visuals of season 2 even more. Can you believe people say this season looks bad? Like a weirdly large amount of people say this and say that season 1 looks better and I just can't understand it. And now we need to brace ourselves for despair as Yuji has to go through immense suffering. After Yuji sees all the destruction, he has to reaffirm his goals and beliefs so as to keep going and fighting for what he believes in. However, this gets increasingly more and more difficult as he starts losing people. Nanami is a character that I loved in the first season and was one of, if not my favorite character. I mean, just look at him. He's got the drip. Look at the fucking drip, man. He's relatable. And not only do I think he's a great character in his own right, but I also think he makes both the story and our main character, Yuji, like so much better. To explain why, I first have to start with Yuji because when I started the story, of Jujutsu Kaisen, I wasn't very sold on Yuji's motivation. His grandpa tells him to help people, then falls over and dies, and because of that, Yuji really wants to help people, I guess. But really, Yuji's grandpa is saying way more than just help people. What he says specifically is, this is exactly what Nanami struggles with in his life, whether or not he wants to help others or live for himself. The reason he quit being a Jujutsu sorcerer in the first place is that too many of his friends died. He got tired of risking his life and the life of his colleagues for something that isn't rewarding. No one thanks the Jujutsu sorcerers for what they do. It's really dangerous and the only compensation they get is money. And money is available a lot of places, so might as well go work a normal job, right? Because at least then he doesn't have to experience any more death. And this is totally fair, no one said being a Jujutsu sorcerer was easy. But he comes back. He comes back after his visit to the bread store. Welcome to the bread bank. When he notices the curse on the lady's shoulder, he tries to convince himself that it's none of his business. That he can just look the other way and keep earning money. Let's get this bread gamers! But the next time he visits, the need he feels to help her is too strong. He has to exercise the curse because he feels responsible, as he is the only person who can. But this is still something he's struggling with even after he joins Jujutsu High again, because he still doesn't enjoy being a Jujutsu Sorcerer. Even when he's at death's door, there is one thing he deeply wishes, and that is to be by himself on vacation, not worrying about anything, just living for himself. He wishes he could do that, but there is something preventing him from doing so, and that is how he feels that he needs to do the right thing. I love how his change in outfit throughout the series reflects that. From businessman in the beginning of season 1, and gradually becoming less and less uniformal and strict, even losing his glasses in the end, he's one of the very few people in the world that can be a jujutsu sorcerer, so he feels a responsibility to use that power for good. And that's really what I think one of the messages 
advantages of Jujutsu Kaisen is to do good with the advantages that you might have over others. That if you are in any kind of well-off position in any way, it is your duty from one human being to another to obediently be of service to said human being. Not to further distance yourself from them and widen the gap between the two of you. I think this is what Yuji's grandpa was talking about in the beginning of the story. There's definitely a split between the Jujutsu sorcerers where one half of them are like Nanami and works to help others, whereas the other half works to make money and live for themselves. Mei Mei is a great example of the latter. That fucking piece of shit. She doesn't take jobs very often and is only in it for the money. As soon as it seems like she is about to lose the ghetto, she flees the scene, leaving all of her comrades behind. She then sells all of her stocks in Shibuya because she knows what's about to happen there, which is partially her fault. Whereas Nanami, even when he had like basically no energy left, he was really messed up. He still kept fighting. And Yuji is a sorcerer like Nanami, who lives and works to help others. This is why when Nanami dies, he can leave the rest to Yuji, knowing he's one of the good Jujutsu sorcerers. Giving him a beautifully animated sequence of him walking on the beach with the most sad, depressing piano in the background. A scene that was like so short in the manga turned into something so beautiful and lengthy. Like Jujutsu Kaisen is genuinely one of the best anime adaptations I have seen. Like they will just take some panels from the manga and just go above and beyond to elevate it and make it so much better. Also, his ability is just awesome. I love the fact that it's very true to his character in the sense that once he's done working, he wants to be done. But what I love the most is the way it has a condition and the ability will only activate if that condition is met. And that being that the time has to be past working hours. I don't know why, but abilities with conditions and restrictions like these are just so cool to me. Hunter x Hunter is filled with it and I guess kind of what made it popular. I guess it's cool because you can't make your ability overpowered. If you make it too strong, there has to be a downside to it that evens it out. And I guess what's coolest about it is that the ability can be whatever the character wants it to be. I'm not entirely sure if this is how it works in Jujutsu Kaisen 2 as they haven't really explained that aspect of it too much, but I guess it's just the idea that the characters aren't limited to learning pre-existing techniques but can instead choose themselves and the author can be as creative as they want with that ability. No big energy balls or laser eyes or whatever the hell. Not that there's anything wrong with those powers, they can be awesome too, but I just love how unique and specific the other approach is. Like this dude's ability is literally to move in 24 frames per second, like what? In Hunter x Hunter, there's technically nothing you can't do with then, as long as you have the proper restrictions. Okay, that was kind of a tangent, but yeah, his ability is dope. And now, Yuji fights with anger against the biggest piece of shit in the entire story. There is something really effective about having your villain do the most terrible and unspeakable horrors you've ever seen in your life. Now this is where Nobara gets packed up and where I need you guys' help. I need your help because I do not understand Nobara. I think Nobara is a cool side character. She didn't get to do a whole lot in the story, but I enjoyed the moments she had. I really liked her chair analogy, referring to the different people she has in her life. All in all, a fairly enjoyable side character. But I cannot, for the life of me, understand her backstory. Like, okay, I understand a lot of parts of it, but then there will be like a line of dialogue or something that happens that'll have me like... <laughs> What the fuck is going on? We got parts of her backstory back in episode 3 of the first season and already then I was kind of confused. Saori, her teacher, moved to town and everyone hated her. Like, to an extreme extent. But like, why? And then at the end of the flashback, we see a doll head lying in the snow. What? What is happening? We then get like a full version of this flashback before she dies. And again, a lot of this stuff is completely understandable. But then there will be things that are so weird. Like, why was Saori always at home? What the fuck was up with this woman? We see her at the end and she's completely normal. I guess the main part I'm confused about is why people hated her so much. Like, did they really just not like city full. So uh, yeah, I don't know. If someone else has any insight, please let me know. Now, anyway, after losing Nanami, Yuji fights with anger against Mahito. But all the anger in the world is not enough for Yuji, as he loses another person. Maybe. And his resolve finally breaks. Okay, 
Toto is just the coolest character, bro. He is literally Giga Chad. This is the hardest pull up of all time. Bro is actually in an edit. And this is when Toto has to give Yuji a pep talk, just like every big brother should. Teaching Yuji a similar lesson to what Nanami learned that no matter how shady the situation may be, you have a duty to do the best you can because you're the only person who can do so. Telling Yuji to fight for what his fallen comrades entrusted with him, regardless of how weak his conviction might be right now. But Toto is one of the characters that I wasn't too crazy about when he first got introduced, or at least not as crazy about him as I am now. A lot of people call Toto a silly, kind of a goofy character, and while he might be the reason for a lot of silly and comedic moments, in none of these moments is he actually trying to be funny, but rather the opposite. In every line of dialogue he has, he's always serious and always says what he has on his mind, regardless of how that might be received by others. And Fushiguro quickly finds this out when he can't even answer a simple fucking question. When watching the scene for the first time, like I said, I didn't really love Toto yet. It almost seemed like he was being built up to be like a rival type character who I was supposed to dislike, along with Maki. But this quickly changed during the Kyoto exchange event. This is the first time we see him take on the role of Yuji's big brother. And at first, it's kind of hilarious. My best but again, Toto is being dead serious and quickly starts teaching Yuji, making him improve in ways that he never had before. This is a good way to make the audience appreciate his character more by having him teach our main character various things and make him stronger. I mean, Toto teaches Yuji more in the span of like 30 minutes than Gojo had done the entire season up to that point. Toto is absolutely a man of his word and like I said, always says what he means. He said that him and Yuji were best friends and I think if you were to ask Yuji at the end of the second season who his best friend friend was, I genuinely think he would have said Toto. At least he should say Toto anyway. I mean, he was there for him at his lowest moment and has done more for him than any other character could. I think it can be easy to misunderstand Toto at first when he's going around asking people what type of woman is their type, but I think he's way smarter than he seems. IQ I think the point of asking people this question is not for him to know what the other person responds, but rather how they respond. Kind of like a test. And I believe this mostly because of a character that Toto is very fond of himself, Yuki Tsukumo. This is who Toto learned the question from, and we get to see firsthand how she asks the question to other people, mainly Ghetto. She asks Ghetto this question along with a bunch of other questions to get to know more about what Ghetto is thinking and who exactly he is. When Toto asks it to Fushigiro, Fushigiro gives an answer that isn't really an answer at all, but rather answers it in a very roundabout way, revealing absolutely nothing. In other words, he is trying to avoid the question. This, of course, Toto doesn't like and proceeds to beat the shit out of him. But when he asks this to Yuji, Yuji gives an honest answer by saying he likes big booty bitches. This, of course, makes Toto take a liking to Yuji. Not because he likes big booty bitches, but I mean, of course, that is very valid in itself, but because he answers straightforward and honestly. So to sum it up, this question is used for different reasons. Number one, it gives the audience a chance to learn what type of person the character that gets asked the question really are. Number two, to give Toto a way to learn whether or not the person is someone he likes or not as soon as he meets them. And three, because it's really fucking funny. A supporting character in the easiest way explained is supposed to help the main character achieve their goal have a transformation or move the story forward. And Toto Aoi does all of the above. And looking back, you know, I probably should have realized that he was the best character after he said he liked girls with fat asses, but uh, yeah, I guess that's my fault. And what follows is one of, if not the best fight in the series so far. I think one of the main reasons this fight works so well is that there are three characters involved. Typically in anime, I feel like it's most common to see like one-on-one -on -one fights. So this was kind of refreshing, especially because it managed to focus on the three characters equally. None of them felt like they were getting more spotlight than the others. Yuji got it back in blood, Toto was just the goat, and Mahito continues to show how much of an asshole he is. I think my favorite character in this fight though is Toto. Every part of this fight he manages to have some sort of insane moment. He starts off by completely outplaying Mahito, having the coldest entrance ever, and giving Yuji like an urban level pep talk, then goes on to have some of the most well animated sequences in the fight. It really seems like the animators love Toto because the direction during his scenes are incredible. His personality and charisma is incredible, managing to be silly and goofy but also serious at the same time. I mean they give him a whole music video in the middle of an episode, like what? <laughs> 
He also keeps the fight extremely entertaining because of his ability. Boogie Woogie. Toto's ability is just so fucking cool, alright? Like, there's no other way to say it, it's just cool. All the best moments and fights involving Toto is when he uses his ability. And what I love about it is how many different ways he can use it. He can switch places with people, objects, switch places by high-fiving someone, by clapping his cheeks. There are just so many different possibilities with this ability. To me, a good ability or power is one where the character keeps using the power in new and different ways. This is why Luffy from One Piece almost always has a new way to use the gum gum fruit, which is a power that is really basic. But through Luffy's creativity, he can use it to do everything from a pistol, bazooka, UFO, or even turning himself into a balloon. Even the most simple attack like the Kamehameha was used in a new way during Dragon Ball Super when Goku uses it to slide on a different key blend. Something we had never seen him do before. That's why that was so cool. And this is also almost 40 years after after the technique first got showed up, and it's still being used in new ways. One of my favorite moments from the Mahito fight is when Toto switches places with Yuji by clapping Mahito's hand, because we had never seen him clap his opponent's hand before. Of course, this moment is also great because it involves a lot of risk having to come in contact with Mahito. It was honestly just really satisfying to see all the times Mahito got like completely outplayed by it. like. Damn, bro does not learn. This part of the story also has a lot of changes and additions to the manga, just like the rest of the season. Now, when it comes to directing and adaptation, you also need to understand the story. Like, really understand it. You need to know what type of facial expression the character is making in the source material and know exactly what feeling they're feeling. Otherwise, you'll end up communicating something different to the audience than what was intended. Now, when it comes to adaptations, I will say that I prefer a one-to-one -one remake. No changes or additions, just do what the original did. Because if you don't, you're basically saying that you can do better than the original and that's kind of crazy to say. But there were actually a decent amount of changes that were made in this season, changes that I think made the show better. For example, the Nanami beach scene. This is how that part looked like in the manga. AKA, it doesn't exist. But still, I think it makes this whole part and Nanami's character a lot better. It emphasizes how Nanami struggles with choosing between helping others and living for himself. He is doing the right thing to do while simultaneously wishing he was on holiday. It makes us understand him more and makes the lesson behind his character clearer. This is a scene that a director with a surface level understanding of the story wouldn't be able to add. One of my favorite moments from this season is during the Jogo and Sukuna fights when Jogo is spamming fire all over the place and you see the temperature display in the background. As the fire approaches, it quickly rises to 100. Now, we could already figure out that it's pretty hot there, but like, now we really know it's hot. Oh my god! Wow! And that wasn't in the manga at all. This is also an anime exclusive part. It's honestly pretty funny, but isn't this exactly something Mahito would do? That's just how much of a scumbag he is. And you know what's also anime exclusive? Like all of Toto's best moments from the Mahito fight. Remember the beautifully animated sequence where he switches places with the rock that Yuji throws and just turns into a god? Well, here's how that part looked like in the manga. His whole ass music video in the middle of the episode, that never happens in the manga. And those are both some of my favorite parts of the entire season. Now, real quick, one thing I find kind of weird is that we don't see Inumaki lose his arm. He has like two super random scenes in the entire arc and that's it. It wasn't shown in the manga at all, which I find to be weird. But what's even weirder is that the anime didn't add a scene of that. Considering it adds so many other new scenes that didn't exist before, I feel like this would be a no-brainer. It would give a bigger impact to this scene of Yuji seeing all the destruction and death. I mean, this is like the main reason Yuta gives that the end as to why he wants to execute Yuji, so it really is kind of bizarre that we don't see it actually happen, or see him do anything at all. I think one of the things this arc does incredibly well is how many characters it's able to have participate at the same time without it feeling overwhelming or unnecessary. So what I'm about to say might sound a bit contradictory or unrealistic, but I kind of wish certain characters got to do more, like this whole trio or all of whoever the hell these guys were. But to be honest, 
honest, this is more of a personal wish more than an actual criticism. I just want to see more of Panda, to be honest. I wish to see Inuminumaki losing his arm was shown, but anyway. Like I said, I usually don't like it when changes are made, but the changes they did this season were really great. So is it fine for changes to be made? Well, I still prefer a one-to-one, -one, but if a change is made that I think is good, I'll be more than fine with it. And the changes they did to this fight against Mahito really justify themselves. And speaking of Mahito, this fight really continues to show how effective of a villain he is. I hate the way that you walk, the way that you talk, I hate the way that you dress. Mahito is an absolute scumbag. I know this man puts on the black air forces every day when he wakes up in the morning. In fact, he probably keeps them on while sleeping. Mahito is exceptionally good at one thing, and that is making the audience hate him. A lot of stories has this one character that you just hate, that you want to beat the ever-living shit out of, because that's just how annoying they are. That is how much pain they cause you, and they are not even a real person. And part of the reason these characters work so well is that you know that they're gonna get what's coming to them. And when they do, it will be immensely satisfying. Mahito takes joy in torturing others and seeing how it affects that person. And this is what makes him a perfect antagonist for this story and for Yuji. When Jogo dies, he says that to humans, death is a mirror and Mahito is that mirror. Everyone knows that death exists and is inevitable, but spend their whole life ignoring and running from it. After all, no one wants to die, so they hide from it. Yuji rejects that. He has his own outlook on it and certain beliefs on how one should die. He doesn't care about his own life, but wants to save and help as many people as he can before dying. This means that killing Yuji won't cause Mahito any satisfaction. Instead, he kills the people he cares about. Junpei, Nobara, Nanami, whoever he can get his hands on ought to see how it affects Yuji. He wants to break him. He experiments with people and death like he was a child. And every time Mahito succeeds in this, he is at his happiest. He laughs in Yuji's face, talks shit like it's a COD lobby. That's why your mama did. This is the happiest Mahito has ever been. And after Yuji is finally broken, he's ready to kill him and move on to the next. But Yuji doesn't break. He overcomes his doubts and his convictions become firmer than they ever have been. The opposite of what Mahito wanted. Although I wasn't a big fan of how this fight ended. So the reason why the ending to the fight with the old mustache dude was so satisfying is because they figured out how his ability worked and then figured out a plan on how to beat that ability. Mahito has basically been Yuji's biggest biggest op since day one, so I was expecting Yuji to outplay or outsmart him in some incredible way, but instead, the person who effectively secures the W is Toto. Toto fakes Mahito out and therefore creates an opportunity for Yuji to strike, making Yuji the winner. But the only reason he won was because Toto just so happened to come up with a plan that let Yuji get a good punch in, and there is no way they could have planned for this to happen beforehand as it required Toto to lose his hand. And while I don't really like that Yuji doesn't secure the dub himself by his own merits, I still really love this moment from Toto. Even after he lost his arm and by extension his ability, beaten to the ground, he still still gets up to save Yuji, allowing him to secure the dub, accepting what he lost but still fighting just like he told Yuji to. After trying his best to break Yuji, he accidentally created a monster. A monster who will not stop hunting its prey until it's dead. Yuji accepts that he and Mahito are the same, killing in line with their own personal morals or interests. The only difference is who they are killing. This is one of the best scenes in the story, and it exists because of Mahito. Every time he takes someone away from Yuji, he receives massive growth and develops as a character, and this is exactly the job of the antagonist. Now as much as I love Mahito in this arc and in the series, I gotta say that his death and absorption is very lackluster for me. Yuji doesn't end up killing him, even though he said he was, and as much as that might be a bit disappointing for some, I don't really mind the way he ends up getting killed by Kenjaku instead. But my issue is that the scene of his absorption itself is so lackluster. It's one of the few instances of weak directing even though it's such an important moment. I think partially it has to do with how tame the music is and how you can barely hear it. It's not really dramatic at all, even though the main antagonist of the show so far is dying right in front of the main character's eyes. And speaking of main character, it's like Yuji doesn't even care that he dies. We get no actual reaction from him as it's happening aside from his reaction shot after he gets sealed, which doesn't really tell me a whole lot. Then the opening plays and that's it. We immediately go into Kenjaku explaining his plan. It's like the show assumed that I knew this would happen, even though I basically had no idea that this was the dynamic 
conflict between Kenjaku and Mahito, and that Kenjaku would even want to kill Mahito at all, aside from some very brief dialogue. This moment reminds me so much of the Vegeta Nappa moment in Dragon Ball, but lacks the aspects that made that moment so special. It's a bit disappointing, but who cares, because the last two episodes are honestly fantastic, with Kenjaku finally unleashing his plan fully. Even though we just finished an incredible fight, probably the best part of the story so far, it still doesn't let up the gas, and instead keeps going with another amazing fight. I think what I love the most about this fight is just how much it evolves. At this point, Yuji has been fighting for 4 episodes straight, and keeps fighting for another 2. And I think what's important when a fight is really long like this is that it changes and switches up. And this fight certainly does that, without even having to talk about the 4 episodes that came before it. It starts off with Kenjaku showing up to face Yuji, he then absorbs Mahito, then the Kyoto sorcerers show up one by one, then Choso shows up, then Uraume shows up, then Yuki shows up. Like this truly feels like a season finale, pulling out all the stops and remaining available characters, resulting in a pretty entertaining fight. Choso's ability continues to be awesome, and it's cool to see him actually finding ways to almost deal damage to Genjaku. I guess I also just like fights where a bunch of characters come together to fight a stronger opponent. Kind of like the Sea Fighters versus Nappa or Frieza, or when they fight that teleportation dude from Mob Psycho. It's kind of cool how everyone gets their little moment. Even Miwa gets one of the hardest pull-ups in the show, just to get clapped, like, instantly. But anyway, this is when we get to the end. The end of Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2, which, in my opinion, is the best anime adaptation I have ever seen. It manages to make me really excited for the next season by ending on one hell of a cliffhanger and showing signs of what's to come. The story isn't perfect. It's not perfect as an adaptation either, but that doesn't take away from how incredible it is. I have never seen a season of anime with better art, animation, and direction. Every single frame has so much care and effort into it that it is actually unbelievable. I would lose my shit if season 3 got the same treatment. And I can only imagine how awful the working conditions were for the animators that were a part of creating these episodes, only for IGN to give it a 6 out of 10. The characters are incredibly well written, and I really cannot wait for the future of Jujutsu Kaisen. One thing I hope it does a bit better is something I have alluded to a few times during this review, so you have to check out this video to hear that.